So we're absolutely delighted um, to be recognised as an exemplar employer, a uh, gold award uh, winner for uh, uh, the support we give to uh, military veterans. Um, this has been a long journey for us. It was 2012 Armed Forces uh, Day when we committed to uh, this journey, that's like seven years. And it's a reflection of uh, the hard work of so many people right across the council, so passionate and committed to actually do the best we can for our Armed Forces um, uh, community. We have a big Armed Forces, uh, ex-Armed Forces community uh, in Thameside, 7,500 uh, uh, individuals including families and I always say that this isn't just about uh, military veterans it's about their families too and how we support them and it's, it's a brilliant thing for, for us to welcome uh, those individuals into our community uh, effectively because actually they've got such massive positive transferable skills and they make such a brilliant contribution uh, to our community. So we've made sure that any uh, military veteran that comes to us unemployed we've made sure that we've found them a job uh, whether with the council or through other means. We have no rough sleepers who are military veterans and we have no military veterans who are on our um, uh, housing waiting lists. So really specific, tangible things that benefit people. A couple of projects we're really positive about. Um, first one, and it sounds a little bit uh, anorak of this, making sure that military veterans are on the GP uh, register in terms of so when, it, when they see a GP they absolutely know that they're a military veteran. That's important because they can access so many other different additional services and also that they can make sure that the GP knows what their, their uh, medical history is. That's been so successful that we're actually a national, we're promoting it nationally um, and I wanted just to uh, show this because this is the work that we're doing nationally across the NHS to promote that scheme and this is a pamphlet that explains all that. Another uh, specific scheme that we're very proud of is the partnership we're doing with Sport England, £300,000, which is about addressing um, um, social isolation as well as physical inactivity. A uh, very powerful uh, programme of putting on sporting activities uh, for military veterans. Some of the traditional stuff like football and rugby and cricket, but it's gone on to things like yoga, even ballroom dancing and uh, a delegation of our military veterans went into a regatta uh, in Weymouth quite recently. So really great stuff that actually adds up to very positive things. They protect us. They defend us. They help us in times of need. But they're being destroyed from within. Last year saw more army suicides than any year on record. Day. Our son was just one of thousands of veterans that this country has lost to suicide. After day. Only to die here at home in their sleep. After day. He then used a pistol to take his own life. There is a hidden enemy at work. It's got to stop. And it's hiding in plain sight. The most dangerous enemy is the one you never suspect. June 18, 1940. Psychiatrist and Brigadier General J.R. Reese addressed the annual meeting of the National Council for Mental Hygiene with a strategic plan for psychiatry. We must aim to make it permeate every educational activity in our national life. Public life, politics and industry should all of them be within our sphere of influence. But to reach their objectives, Psychiatrists needed the perfect proving ground. One with an unlimited budget that could keep on growing. It's all about money. Billions. Billions of dollars. It's our tax money. A proving ground with an endless supply of human resources. More people than any other organization in America. These troops are the guinea pigs. They're being experimented on. A proving ground where every order is obeyed, no questions asked. You have to obey those orders. You don't have an option. I'm legally obligated. And a proving ground where any collateral damage 
would be labeled classified. This story has been censored every step of the way. Brigadier General Reese knew where to look. The Army and the other fighting services form rather unique experimental groups since they are complete communities. And it is possible to arrange experiments in a way that would be very difficult in civilian life. It was a shrewd tactic, especially when sold under the guise of help. And now a soldier was sick. And unless we do something for him, he may remain sick for an indefinite period of time. Gentlemen, you are not requested to treat these patients. You are directed to do so. Psychiatrists had come a long way. Only 20 years earlier, they were almost unheard of in military life. It wasn't until World War I that they came out of the asylums and sort of worked their way into the military. It was a very slow, very gradual insertion. Slow and gradual, because psychiatrists were simply not trusted, and for good reason. Their treatments were never known to be scientific. In fact, many of their experimental procedures would later be labeled torture. One of the first uses of uh, psychiatric treatment actually goes back to World War I when it was used on German soldiers uh, who were deserting and trying to leave the front because of the horrors of the trench warfare on the Western Front. This treatment was dubbed Kaufman Cure after its inventor, but few would have called it therapeutic. The traumatized soldier was hooked up to an electric current, which was ratcheted up until he couldn't take it any longer. During this, the practitioner laid in hypnotic suggestions. This Kaufmann therapy was from the psychiatrists as a heal therapy. Angewandt and eingeführt. For the soldiers, it was all other than healing, because it was a pain that was added to the blood masses. And so was the true reason why the soldiers then wieder an die Front gingen, nämlich, dass sie diese Schmerzen nicht mehr aushalten konnten und lieber sich in äh, Kampfeinsatz wagten, als, so, als in der Klinik dauernd Schmerzen zu ertragen. But the pain these soldiers suffered didn't prevent psychiatrists from continuing their experimentation into World War II. And just as before, it was not designed to help their patients overcome the trauma of war. Zum einen war man von Seiten der Wehrmedizin im Zweiten Weltkrieg bestrebt, den Patienten noch schneller, als dies im Ersten Weltkrieg gelungen war, wieder an die Front zurückzuschicken. Das war der erste und sozusagen das entscheidende Ziel, das die Kriegspsychiatrie im Zweiten Weltkrieg hatte. All around the world, psychiatrists used the war as an opportunity to try some very risky treatments on soldiers who had very little to say in the matter. They were electroshocking some, putting others into a deep coma, and filling yet more with powerful, mind-altering drugs. As they infiltrated further and further, they became involved in military recruitment, training, discipline, morale. They were even making opinions about the selection of officers. Then Poole, Poole is an odd sort of man, in civilian life, he was very badly adjusted, in the personal sense, that is. He just couldn't mix, couldn't make friends. By 1943, psychiatry had penetrated so deeply into the American military, the Navy's top psychiatrist bragged, Psychiatry now has a place in every step of the Navy man's career, from his induction to his eventual separation from the service. It is because of the military that psychiatrists, they became important, you know? They're wearing a uniform now, and they've got the epaulets, and you know, they've got some power because of the military. The military gave them that. The United States Chief Military Psychiatrist, Brigadier General William Menninger, even wrote a manual listing all the mental problems he thought soldiers could have. But there were no blood tests, no x-rays, nothing observed under a microscope, just opinions. Scientific evidence? No, sir. But this only helped psychiatry. After all, 
Menninger's Army Manual provided a veneer of legitimacy, something they could use to diagnose and treat even more service members. The Army Manual was so widely used, it became the foundation for psychiatry's Bible, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM. Because of the influence of people like Menninger, by the middle of World War II, militaries around the world were buying into psychiatrists' claims that they were the mental health experts. And because of that, psychiatrists were free to try out drugs on a lot more soldiers. The drugs of choice are the barbiturates. You will note that in combat exhaustion, massive doses of these drugs are needed in therapy. During the Second World War, uh, both Americans and Germans experimented with uh, stimulants. Because uh, everybody thought, well, this is great, you know, it helps you focus, it keeps you awake. One such drug was Pervitin, which was given to German soldiers to lower inhibitions and increase aggressiveness. Man kann sagen, dass dieser Feldzug durchaus Pervitin getränkt war, was die Wehrmachtssoldaten betrifft. Die Wehrmachtssoldaten waren für ihre ähm, Gegner unfassbar fit, sie waren unfassbar wach, sie hielten sehr, sehr lange durch, sie waren furchtlos, sie waren aggressiv und wirkten vor allem auf die Gegner wie aufgezogen. Il a fallu à peu près 18 mois pour que les accidents apparaissent en nombre considérable, c'est-à-dire des jeunes soldats qui brutalement se conduisaient comme des bêtes féroces, euh, tiraient sur tout ce qui bougeait, euh, sur les civils et, et sur leurs propres euh, compatriotes. Et les, les, les accidents, les imprudences au pilotage d'avions, au pilotage de chars ont été tels que l'armée allemande a interdit l'utilisation de ces drogues à partir du milieu de l'année 42 ou 43. Et l'armée anglaise a vécu la même expérience. Stimulants were also used by the Japanese. They gave its fighters instant courage, but at a price. The soldier pictured here was a World War II torpedo pilot. The mission, to be placed inside a manned torpedo that would be manually detonated when close to an enemy ship. あの、ま、海軍の中ではね、え、とにかく先行艇部隊、ま、先行艇による特攻を、ま、とに成功させるために、ということで、海軍ぐるみでっていうかね、え、でもって、とにかく搭乗員たちにアンフェタミンを投与
With one man climbing a tree, the troop commander gives up, saying, I cannot do anything about this. I cannot control the men and I can take no action myself. I am wiped out as an attacking force. Soviet psychiatrists gave their soldiers God knows what. Soviet army, I was a soldier. And usually, after the meal, the doctor came to the hospital and gave us a package so we put it in the bush or in the bush and put it in. We usually said, what is this? Он, это нормально, это витамины. Но что это такое, я не знаю. Тем более, что мы, повара, обычно свою долю вынимали из котла до того, как приходил доктор. Up through time, soldiers continue to be given psychiatric drugs for uses never studied or approved. It's been one huge experiment. In the Falklands campaign, um, air crew were given uppers and downers so that their flight duty voters could be maximized. We've gotten reports that the Gulf War II pilots do take amphetamines, they do take dexedrine, and that at the uh, nighttime they're given Ambien to bring them down so they can sleep. So they're, they're continuously on this up and down kind of uh, scenario. Certainly in the Iraq, Afghanistan um, wars, psychiatry has played a huge role, huge. Psychiatry is now an accepted part of militaries around the world. We're told we should trust psychiatrists, that they're the authorities. Only one problem though, things haven't gotten better. They've only gotten worse. I spent uh, almost 26 years on active duty in the Marine Corps. I retired with the grade of Brigadier General. I was an Army Captain in the Aviation Branch. I was a Staff Sergeant E-5 in the United States Air Force. I was in the United States Marine Corps from 2007 to 2011. Florida Army National Guard. 31st Engineering Battalion. I was an Aviation and Military Intelligence. Battlefield Intelligence Analyst. I was a U.S. Navy fighter pilot. Combat medic with an LPN license. So my nomenclature would be a 68 Whiskey Mike 6. I got out as a, uh, as a sergeant, uh, non-commissioned officer, uh, this past March. I didn't see the emergence of psychiatry in the Army up until I suffered my own injury. And then it was like, it was a flood. It was a flood of doctors and it was a flood of meds. There's just as much stress on today's soldier as in the past. Long hours, grueling missions, extended periods away from loved ones. And when mental and emotional problems strike, there's no doubting their reality. But no matter where soldiers go for help, in today's military, they often end up in the hands of a psychiatrist. You can go to the chaplain, and the chaplain is just somebody that you can talk to. But I think part of the issue is that a, a chaplain is kind of obligated to route you straight to a psychiatrist if you mention any key words, you know? Like, yeah, I have been stressed out or something like that. If you tell therapists you're depressed, that's what the, that's, they're going to send you to a psychiatrist. It's going to happen. It's just how it works. So they'll make um, a real quick decision on you have a problem or what the problem might be within just minutes. So 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, if you're lucky, 45 minutes in the office. Standard practice for a psychiatrist is first to diagnose you with a mental disorder. He might tell you that you have a chemical imbalance in the brain, even though he hasn't done any tests to prove it. And he never will, because there is no test. In fact, there are no tests for practically any of the hundreds of mental illnesses listed in psychiatry's diagnostic manual. Psychiatry, especially, has no objective means of making any diagnosis. In general medicine, at least you have x-rays and blood tests to go on, 
And so that's the big, big dilemma faced by psychiatry. They have zero ability to diagnose, so they have zero ability to treat. No physical abnormality has ever been found. So there is no physical abnormality to demonstrate by an MRI, a CT, an EEG. It's another fraud, pure and simple. It's another fraud. So psychiatrists are diagnosing you with brain diseases, physical things wrong with your brain that they can't even prove exist. There were no medical tests of any kind. There were no blood tests. Uh, nothing that I could tell that was scientific in any way or medical in any way. Somebody suggests that you have a, you know, a disorder, a disease or something, there should be some sort of objective test. It's not unreasonable to ask for it. It's not unreasonable to insist on it. But you won't get one from psychiatrists, only their opinions. And they won't be shy about giving those. There are troops that are that are seeing psychiatrists who are automatically, before they even open up their mouth, being diagnosed just because of the way how they look. The psychiatrist told me that I would never amount to anything in the military again because of the, uh, the emotional trauma I experienced and my current, at the time, my depression levels, my stress, my anxiety. I was never going to accomplish anything in the military. I would never be a good soldier again and the only viable option that the military saw was to discharge me. When a psychiatrist says your life is not worth anything because it's been all some sort of psychosis or some sort of trauma event or you've got this disease or that or some brain chemical or, or whatever, a soldier's life turns into nothing. Every year, thousands of men and women in uniform are diagnosed with a mental illness, sometimes even two or three. This has gotten so out of control that the U.S. Pentagon now spends $2 billion a year on mental health alone. And the Veterans Administration's mental health budget has gone ballistic, shooting up from less than $3 billion in 2007 to nearly $7 billion in 2014. That's a lot of money to spend on a profession that can't even find evidence for its brain diseases under a microscope. Not that this matters to psychiatrists. The diagnosis is only a first step, actually an excuse, to get you onto some very dangerous treatments. I joined the Navy when I was 17, and I was, I retired, I was medically discharged, I should say, from the SEAL teams. I served my country with America's best in a time of war. And I had the honor of leading them. But I did lose, you know, my swim buddy, which is my, the guy you go through SEAL training with. And that gave me a survivor's guilt that I can't begin to describe. And you know, I make it through combat in multiple firefights and nothing. I, I got blown up by an IED. It broke my neck, you know, and I didn't know it at the time. But, but I lived with that for like five years, make it through all of that. And they, you know, I come back and they almost kill me with pills. The almost inevitable result of a psychiatric diagnosis is a prescription for a psychiatric drug. There's very little else psychiatrists do and they've been prescribing a lot. From 2005 to 2011, the U.S. Department of Defense increased its prescriptions of psychiatric drugs by nearly seven times. That's over 30 times faster than civilians. The drug push is no different for veterans. Depression is a disease. We get this guy from the Veterans, I think the Veterans Administration or something like that, and he's basically telling you, if you are depressed, if you do something erratic, it's a disease. It's a, I mean, this is, this, this guy is literally the loudest guy in the entire briefing. You know, very just in your face about it. And he's just basically saying, you know, if you're doing anything other than what you normally do, you, you have a disease and you need to, you need to be put on the system. You need drugs. We can control it with medication. 
and then right after that, they're gonna get prescribed whatever drug the psychiatrist seems fit rather than just being able to talk to somebody. No therapy, no lifestyle change. It's, it's a straight line of how they educate these doctors in pharmacology, a symptom to a drug. Psychiatrists have no real idea of what their drugs are doing to the human body. But when it comes to handing them out, that hardly matters. My older brother um, got out of the Marine Corps, like I said, about a year ago. And when he went to the VA um, hospital to make his disability claim and uh, talk to him, he told him that he had uh, trouble sleeping. And he didn't tell me what, he, what they gave him, but he basically said they gave him a big bag of happy pills. So I came home on R&R &R from Iraq and got severely depressed. And they went and told me to go see Don-based um, psychologist, which then they prescribed me meds. He basically told me what was wrong with me and uh, prescribed me with Zoloft, and uh, that was pretty much it. I have know that I've been on um, Ambien, Seroquel, Paxil. That was one of the big ones. A very dangerous drug that I, I'm just think is very harmful called Abilify. It kind of puts whatever meds you're on on steroids. Welbutrin, Zoloft, Modafinil, Methylphenidate, um, Trazodone, Prezacin, and Ambien. Starts out with Dexedrine, Vibrid, Dalmane, Salopram, Thorazine, Citalopram, Prozac, 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 and effects are at the same time. Stelazine, Zoloft, Compazine, Seroquel, Cogentin, Abilify, Nodular, Rubrucin, IV Amitol, Depakote, Artane, Xanax, Helperidol or Haldol, Clonopin, Mazepam, Adderall, and Librium. From 5 milligrams to 300. 300 milligrams. 1,200 milligrams of lithium a day. Most individuals who would be given these, these drugs have no clue what the drug is, really, or what it can do to the mind, really. They just don't know. So they're, it's, it's, it's a blind date. And it's, uh, and sometimes it turns out to be kind of an ugly one. The drugging of the military is off the charts, especially in the United States. In total, over the last 10 years, the U.S. government has spent more than $4.5 billion just medicating soldiers and veterans. In fact, in 2011, the Pentagon spent more on pills, injections, and vaccines than on Black Hawk helicopters, Abrams tanks, Hercules C-130 cargo planes, and Patriot missiles combined. The use of both psychiatry and psychotropic drugs has just ballooned in the U.S. military. Every soldier that I've talked to, every time they've seen a psychiatrist, they would prescribe them some kind of psychotropic drug right off the bat. I would say 60 to 70 percent of the soldiers we saw in our, in our center uh, were on medication. Let me give you an example. I was on a, uh, on a committee, a scholarship committee for veterans at a, at a college, and they invited the VA psychiatrist to come in to give a talk about post-traumatic stress disorder. But at the very end, I raised my hand, I said, how many of your veterans that you see do you medicate? And initially he tried to skirt the answer. He said, I see the most difficult. And I said, we all see the most difficult. How many do you medicate? 98%. It's criminal. And it isn't much better in the rest of the world. I deal a lot with a lot of our soldiers within our NATO brothers and sisters. Canada, New Zealand, Australia, UK, um, Germany, France, Belgium, and even soldiers down in Italy and even in Spain. Each and every one of them have complained about the issues dealing with psychotropic drugs with them. I was stationed in Germany for a while. I was in Kosovo for a while. And uh, they had talked about that, yeah, when they see the psychiatrist, they do give them psychotropic drugs. So it seems like it's a worldwide problem. A lot of our veterans have told us that when they went for help whilst they were still serving, 
They were then prescribed medication. It didn't help. Quand on envoie un patient chez un psychiatre, il ressort directement avec des molécules chimiques. Et ça, on commence à avoir les effets secondaires et on commence à avoir les problèmes. Et правде, psychiatres давали військовослужбовцям небезпечні наркотики. При цьому знаєте, що військовослужбовці мають в руках небезпечну зброю. О, nonsense. Så finns det ju någon drivande orsak till att vi skriver ut mer och mer piller. Men vi får ju inte det förväntade resultatet. But no matter the country, this is the military. And in the military, soldiers have no choice but to follow orders. When I'm wearing this uniform, if I'm ordered to see a psychiatrist, I have to go to see a psychiatrist. Um, it, if I'm not in this uniform, I can tell them no. The suggestion to go see the psychiatrist came across as a, a heavy recommendation. It wasn't a direct order, but it was, this is something you should go do. It's something that needs to be handled. You should go do this. And then there's the pressure put on you to take the drugs. I actually asked my commander that. I said, do I have to take these drugs if it's an, is this an order? And they all just stared at me, wouldn't give me a no or a yes imply that I'm supposed to take this. I would have refused. I probably would have lost my rank or lost opportunities in the military because I wasn't taking care of the property of the military, which was my body. Most of the troops that I talked with did not want to take the psychiatric drugs, did not want them, did not need them, and rebelled at having to take them. But they were told that if you don't take these drugs, you can't get your compensation, and you can't get any more VA treatment if you deny the drug usage. So they did. I have heard that military personnel have been ordered to take these drugs. My response to that is, that's an illegal order. And I had that verified by a judge advocate general right here in Washington, DC. It's illegal to demand that. If a psychologist tells you that you have to take it or you're going to lose your benefits, you need to report that psychologist to the proper authorities. Officially, one in six American service members is on at least one psychiatric drug. But here's the thing. According to the Armed Services Committee of the United States Senate, no one knows how many drugs are given to soldiers downrange. There's no paper trail, no prescriptions. They're just handed out. Fact is, the amount of psychiatric drugging in the military is probably much, much higher. Particularly when so many qualify for psychiatry's biggest diagnosis drugging combo of all. I was in the Army, and when I got out I was corporal. And then I went back as a contractor for uh, the Department of the Army. Uh, my original purpose was uh, definitely get involved, serve my country, and then uh, pursue it from that point forward. I personally was, was, uh, had been deployed to Iraq for uh, just about a year, and uh, having gone back to Europe, I was uh, having trouble sleeping, and um, having some issues just adjusting back to this, you know, different lifestyle after having been shot at and nearly blown to pieces, you know, so many times to this, now I can get, just go down the road and get a pizza. Um, and uh, one of my officers recommended I go see a psychiatrist. Yeah, within 10 minutes it was, so you're uh, probably bipolar, uh, most likely ADD and uh, PTSD. The visible effects of combat stress have been mentioned by ancient writers like Homer and Herodotus. The French called it mal de pays. The Germans, Heimweh. In Spain, it was estar roto. Whatever they've called it, centuries of militaries have acknowledged that sometimes the horrors of war can be too much for soldiers to bear. It used to be considered a nervous reaction, an expected part of combat. But psychiatrists today label it a brain dysfunction, which began life in 1980 as post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. This war isn't any different than any other than guys coming back with shell shock, um, battle fatigue or combat fatigue. And, and you know, now they're calling it post-traumatic stress disorder. It's, it's been around forever. 
and like their other disorders, it wasn't found through scientific testing. It was lobbied for by psychiatrists and voted into Psychiatry's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Literally voted in. Today, it's military psychiatry's most popular diagnosis, and it spread rapidly into the civilian world. The goal is to combat post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. Helping veterans with PTSD. A soldier's post-traumatic stress disorder. I was diagnosed with PTSD. 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 How many times do you hear PTSD in the media now? Uh, people really don't understand it, I don't think, and we're just trying to assign a label uh, to people uh, our soldiers and sailors that are coming back from these very horrific events that they're being witness to. People who suffer from post-traumatic stress are reacting to a traumatic event in a normal fashion. What we believe is that the military is treating veterans in particular with post-traumatic stress as though they have a mental illness. We don't believe they have a mental illness. We believe that they're wounded and what they need is healing. And PTSD psychiatry has created a disease, they speak of it as a disease just as they speak of generalized anxiety disorder and clinical depression as diseases, but none of them are actual diseases. If someone shows up in my practice and they say a psychiatrist or other doctors diagnosed me uh, with post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, I would actually ask the patient, well, okay, what tests were done to establish that diagnosis? And they'll think about it and they'll realize that nothing was done. Uh, they just got the opinion of whoever the practitioner uh, was. Certainly there is stress that goes along with combat. Um, when you put a soldier into an environment where he's not getting sleep, he's being shot at, um, friends around him are getting hurt or dying, that's going to cause some bad side effects. Sure, those, those phenomena exist, but that doesn't then equate to, well, let's drug him. There's nothing fake about the horrors of combat stress, but for psychiatry to invent a medical sounding brain dysfunction to convince you to accept their supposed treatment, and then they continue to expand its definition wider and wider. What qualifies for PTSD is recently been uh, downgraded, but uh, they have directives that come out that say, well, now we're gonna suggest that everybody who's, you know, been in a war zone could possibly, maybe, and so with that, anybody qualifies. What I saw with the new um, privates coming in is they were just out of basic training and they were given psych drugs for PTSD, for being in basic training for nine weeks. I was diagnosed uh, with PTSD because I came back and I was a little jittery. Um, and it's just, I guess they said that I had PTSD from that when it was just, I was still kind of trying to assimilate back into the scene of not being in combat, of not being over. The determination that I had PTSD was almost made before I even walked into the office. They told me that it was clear that I had post-traumatic stress disorder and that I needed medication to fix it. Nearly every soldier in my company was diagnosed with PTSD. Nearly every soldier. There are 175 different symptom combinations a psychiatrist can use to diagnose you with PTSD. No surprise then that 37% of recent war veterans are being treated for it. Once labeled, 80% will be given psychiatric drugs. And of those vets drugged, 89% are put on antidepressants and 34% powerful antipsychotics. Even after one of the world's top PTSD psychiatrists did a study admitting that antipsychotics don't work. That just because a medication can be widely prescribed doesn't mean necessarily that it's really helpful for the overall for the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. If psychiatrists bother to do standard medical testing, there's a chance they might find something physically wrong. Something that they would label PTSD, 
but is actual physical damage that can be verified with a brain scan. It's called traumatic brain injury, or TBI, and it's estimated that 320,000 soldiers have suffered from it. Traumatic brain injury is a, it's an injury to the brain itself, either caused by a concussive blast or a closed head wound. There's some difficulty determining between traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress because the symptoms tend to mirror each other. An inability to focus, short-term memory loss, um, difficulty with rage or anger. You're talking about a physical injury, an actual brain injury, as opposed to a mental health, a condition. You know, it's the two absolutely, totally separate things. I'm handling a golf vet who's got traumatic brain injuries. He's labeled with PTSD. Um, and he's got a lump of shrapnel in his head, you know? So, hang on, you don't get lumps of shrapnel flying into your head and embedding in your skull do not leave you with no effect on the brain. The brain's going to take a real hammering from that sort of thing. Of course, most psychiatrists aren't going to spot TBI because they don't check for it. Instead, while the real problem escalates, they'll mask it all with medication which can make things far, far worse. I think my main goal why I joined the military was the first thing is to get money for college. And uh, then all my friends were going in and they were having a blast with it. And I just really wanted to do something with my life and not just stay here in the small town and not do anything. I served in two branches of the military. I served in the Marine Corps and also the Army and got out as a specialist also at E4. When I was in the Marine Corps, I never went and saw a psychologist. But when I was in the Army, they told me I had to go see one. At that point, he diagnosed me with PTSD and prescribed me Prozac and Robuchin um, in Iraq still carrying a weapon, uh, still in the combat zone. The doctor, psychologist said that my anxiety and depression and everything, like stuff like that, should actually go away. And actually it did not, it got worse. The life of a soldier is demanding. You're trained to be alert, decisive and focused, and in top physical and mental shape. It's a necessity. But psychiatric drugs can make you combat ineffective. Psychiatrists know this, but still claim they are therapeutic. Here's the reality. All psychiatric meds are mind-altering drugs. People don't put that together, uh, but they're mind-altering, and they have side effects, disaster side effects. One of the most significant problems about every psychotropic drug that I can think of, the uh, stimulants, the uh, tranquilizers, antipsychotics, mood modulators are unpredictable. I can give the same drug to 20 different men and they'll have 10 different reactions to it. No one, not even the prescriber, knows what will happen with a psychiatric drug. Each one is different and each has a long list of side effects written in small print on its package insert. My friends that take the drugs that I'm prescribed uh, have very bad balance, um, a terrible memory. Uh, they have different, difficult talking clearly, speaking clearly to each other. Their reaction times are very slow and they, they have a hard time concentrating. It pretty much just erased all feelings that I had. So I was just there. A lack of motivation, really. I just stopped caring. I was constantly demotivated, um, very worn down all the time. I was constantly sleepy, like not tired, just sleepy. I could stop doing something and instantly fall asleep. One minute you can be on patrol, the next minute you'd be asleep. That's what those pills do to you. They make you tired. I would get headaches, but it's not like a normal headache. It, it would be like sharp pains just zapping through my head. My anxiety level was through the roof. I had heart problems. Um, I put on 20 to 25 kilos of extra weight. I probably gained 40 pounds over the course of that period of time. I was up to almost 300 pounds. I was in metabolic syndrome. My body 
had my adrenal system had completely shut down. My muscles had seemingly turned to water, and I could not lose weight for anything. I can't ever think of anybody who's ever said, I feel better, this has helped me. I can't honestly think of anybody who's ever said that to me. And I've say, seen and talked to a lot of veterans in my time. These are supposed to be the finest, most elite soldiers, um, you know, physical combat machines, and they're being given something that's harming them, that's destroying not only their body physically, but also their minds mentally. Psychiatrists will tell you that the benefits of their drugs exceed the risks. This is garbage and scientifically untrue. There have been large studies proving that psychiatric drugs like antidepressants work no better than a dummy sugar pill. But some of the drug side effects are not just harmful, they're deadly. On top of all the terrible side effects you can experience with psychiatric drugs is the strangest fact of all. They don't cure anything. So what do they do? They alter your behavior by deadening your feelings. This not only prevents a person from sorting things out, but numbs them to the world around them. There's even a name for it, depersonalization. I've had patients who've been um, given very large doses of psychoactive drugs over a period of about a year and uh, basically destroyed their, their sense of self. They don't care almost about anything. You could go up to someone and start yelling at them and if they're on the large enough cocktail, they won't do anything. They become almost drones. So they're literally lobotomizing our soldiers with these drugs, I'm sorry. That's, I'm just being very direct and honest with my experience of over 200 injured warriors. It's almost like being in a mental hospital with lobotomies, lobotomized patients. I'm sorry, it's just awful. And the depersonalization gets really dangerous when the drug creates another common side effect. If someone is numbed like that, they're less likely to be concerned about their consequences of their behavior and might resort then to impulsive actions, violent actions. Some of the effects of the drugs that we're aware of, that the veterans we've dealt with have, have come across, have been things like more anxiety, um, more anger. They're having all these fits of anger, aggression, they're getting in fights with their significant other. And of course, what this has led to is just a, a really horrendous number of um, domestic shootings, domestic beatings, child, wife uh, abuse. The numbers back it up. Since 2006, violent sex crimes and domestic abuse in the military have increased more than 30%, and child abuse is up 43, all while the psychiatric drugging of our troops has been going out the roof. And then there are the cases where a soldier under the influence of psychiatric drugs loses it all. This one particular morning, uh, the soldier was in that unit, and most of the soldiers in that unit are on uh, some type of medication. And she was waiting for the soldier. And when she walked in, he was locking and loading his weapon. And she asked him, what are you doing? And he looked at her, he said, I don't know. And she said, you were locking and loading, which means he's putting his ammo in his weapon. And she asked him, then she said, what were you going to do? He said, I don't know if I was just going to shoot myself or shoot up everybody in this building and then myself. And we were there. May 11, 2009. Sergeant John Russell opens fire in an Army combat stress clinic in Baghdad. He kills two officers and three enlisted. The day before, his psychiatrist had prescribed him antidepressants. March 11, 2012. In a remote village in Afghanistan, Staff Sergeant Robert Bales murders 16. Nine were children. Before his murder spree, Bales had snorted the psychiatric drug Valium while also drinking alcohol. September 16, 2013. 
Navy veteran Aaron Alexis brings a shotgun to Washington, D.C.'s Navy Yard, where he kills 12 people in cold blood. According to reports, Alexis had been prescribed the antidepressant Trazodone. He talked about it. He said he went to the um, VA and they would give him some medicine. These are just a few of many in the hands of mental health professionals just prior to committing horrific acts of violence. There's Army Private First Class David Lawrence, who murdered a Taliban commander in his prison cell while on Zoloft and Trazodone. Terrence Tyler, a former Marine who gunned down two co-workers, then himself, at a New Jersey supermarket. He had been diagnosed with major depression and was taking Prozac. And Eddie Ray Routh, who murdered a decorated Navy SEAL. He had just gotten out of a mental hospital four days earlier, where he had been treated for PTSD. Drugs and weapons do not mix, okay? It's a recipe for disaster all by itself. They're seeing things different. Their mind has been altered. Their brain has been altered. Their judgment and reasoning is, is not what it would have been without these medications. It's the mind that makes the decision of when to shoot and what to shoot. It's the mind. If you alter the mind and you imbalance the mind, which is what psychiatric drugs do, you change the results of who or what gets shot on the battlefield or at home after the battle is over. Psychiatric drugs don't cause violence only in soldiers. They provoke people from all walks of life to commit deadly mass shootings in our homes workplaces, and schools. Then there's the matter of what they might do to themselves. Ever since I was a little kid, you know, I always loved the military. I loved the Army. And I, I think I always knew that I wanted to, you know, join. I just said, you know, I wanted to go and, uh, experience it, you know, and, you know, just to serve my country. Uh, and then I went to the recruiter station, you know, I said, I want to jump out of airplanes and uh, ride motorcycles. And right then they said, we got a job for you, you know. <laughs> but, you know, I did it and it was good. It was right after combat. So, you know, I started getting these uh, um, dreams and flashbacks and all that stuff. And then, you know, kind of like big anxiety and all that stuff. and. And I went to my doc, and uh, they said, "Yeah, we, you know, we get, we got to get you some meds, you know." And they gave me them, and you know, that was it. You first start taking it, you feel great, whoa! And then, then it just like it's like you get immune to it, and then oh, let's take a higher dose. Let's take a higher dose. In my experience, I didn't see anything helping at all. I felt like it was making everything worse. I gained like how many? Like forty pounds. Um, taking the meds. We looked it up and that one med, I, I don't remember what it was called, but it it said it acted like it. you had like 1,500 calories every pill you took, and I had to take it three times a day. If he missed a dose, then every the whole family would know, the whole house would be kind of on edge because you couldn't talk to him. He, he, would, he would snap. You take your meds and you can just start feeling it going down and then you're just like, bam, and you're just a you're a zombie, you know? It almost seemed like he just didn't care about life anymore. It, he, he wasn't himself. My body was breaking down, and my wife, she's all into herbs, and she, she's, you know, she's saying, this isn't right. And then one, uh, Yeah, I was all fucking drunk, and uh, and uh, you know the meds just taking that shit, and I just said fuck it, I'm done, and uh, I took my pistol and fucking put it in my mouth, and I was, and she opened up the door, I fucking took it, and I was like, I was like, fuck it, this is, so, I said something's. We gotta fucking do something, you know? And it just, this shit just didn't work, you know? And, uh, 
I had to literally grab the weapon away from him because it probably would have happened. That's so why I said, fuck it, I'm stopping. You know, I'm stopping taking all this shit, it's killing me. You know, it's gonna kill me, it's gonna kill my wife, you know. <sighs> um, that was the, the straw that broke the camel's back. It wasn't working and something had to be done. I didn't want to lose my husband. I didn't want him to kill himself and I didn't want to be killed as well in the process. I knew I wasn't me, you know. It was the drug that was, was doing it and, and I knew I had to change or I'd be dead. And that's why I changed it. There is a huge problem with suicides in the military. Since 2002, the rate in the U.S. ranks has almost doubled. The suicide rate has really been going out the roof here lately with our military members, uh, both while they're still in and once they return back to the States. I would move from base to base to base and I'd, I'd be on different missions at different times. Um, and one minute I'm on a base and I'm having lunch and I'm being asked, hey, did you hear about those those three guys, those three soldiers who committed suicide? It was a uh, black eye on, on Fort Bliss. Soldiers were dying left and right. Uh, preventable deaths, we're talking suicides, we're talking about uh, these soldiers getting in their cars going, or motorcycles going 150 miles an hour and, you know, hitting a, a median, um, family violence, uh, it, it, it really spiraled out of control. With all this happening, psychiatrists continue to hand out psychiatric drugs in volume, drugs well known to increase violence and suicidal thinking. My psychiatrist at the time uh, had uh, issued me a recommended gabapentin. And uh, I took one, and in, I think within 30 minutes, I had thoughts of suicide. They started me on a really low dose to build it in my system. But even the low dose, I was still feeling side effects of suicide depression, anxiety. I did notice that there was a lot of times that I thought, you know, that it would just be better to be dead than to keep living like that. And I look back on it now and I, I do realize that it was the meds. Yes, there can be reasons for suicide in today's military that don't involve psychiatric drugs, but it would be stupid to ignore the drug's influence. Just ask the troops with boots on the ground. I was military police, um, actively working as a police officer on the military installation. And in one week, I went to about eight or nine suicide attempts where the person either overdosed or, you know, said that he was gonna kill himself, something like that. And one for one, every single person was on psychiatric drugs. Because of my role as a criminal investigator, I didn't witness the soldiers while they were taking psychiatric drugs. All I got to see was after the suicide or after the death, and then the reports come out. We'd get called pretty often to investigate. We would have an autopsy performed and would uh, include a toxicological exam, which would determine any drugs in the system, and usually there was some type of drug. A lot of them were taking some sort of medication, uh, for depression or anxiety. There were a lot of suicides happening in the military, um, overseas in theater and back in the States. From 2009 to 2012, more U.S. soldiers died by suicide than from traffic accidents, heart disease, cancer, and homicide. The U.S. Secretary of Defense called it an epidemic. So, yeah, it's a problem. Some have claimed that this is because of the stresses of war, but 85% of military suicides never even saw combat, and 52% never deployed. Meanwhile, the competence of military psychiatrists is never even questioned, and it's resulting in suicide attempts such as this one. My son joined the Army. He wanted to make a career and become something. 
He was still sweet and, and more normal when he came back from Iraq, even though he had, you know, nervousness and crowds and PTSD. Uh, he was not different in personality as far as, you know, to that degree, like what we saw later on the drugs. And so when Michael said, hey, I'm, you know, I'm having anxiety issues, I said, you need to go tell them. Well, and that's what really began his journey. That was the, you know, that was the, the worst step, that, in my opinion, that we could have ever done. You know, it started off with one drug and went to two. With each successive um, symptom that he got, he got a new drug. And we noticed that he started to go down in personality. It wasn't our son anymore. It was, you know, anger, slurred speech. It was surreal because the person I was talking to wasn't even my son. He was unsure of himself. He didn't have any, um, any will to do anything. Um, at one point, he had stopped brushing his teeth, drinking water, eating, because he didn't care. He didn't even know that he was that way. And I researched and discovered that our soldiers were being medicated and that they were committing suicide from it. So I printed all my research out and I handed it to my husband. And I said to my husband, tell me what you think of all this research. And he came back to me and said, if my calculations are correct, there's a pattern here that matches our son's behavior. And if my calculations are correct, he's just about ready to commit suicide. I was in the dollar store and he called me and said, I don't want to upset you, but I want you to know Michael's okay. But he tried to kill himself and he put two IVs in his arms and he bled out in the bathtub and he was drawing in his blood on the walls. He didn't even know he was committing suicide. So his cognizance, his reason, was already usurped by these pills. You know, they take away who you are. And he wasn't the same. We had the hospital check him and they found at least nine drugs in his system. And they're just the ones they tested for. They were giving my son drugs that had black box warnings, said, if you're under 25 and you're taking this pill, your risk of suicide is going up 50%. Risk of suicide but they were still giving the pills. What he went through was so horrific, it's hard for him to talk about, but he allows us to speak because he wants to save his comrades. He wants to save others who are going through the same thing, who are being drugged with lethal cocktails. Me speaking as Michael, knowing the things that he has said to others, he would say, stay away from the pills. It's a dead end. Psychiatrists claim their drugs save lives, but they rarely discuss the serious risk of suicide. Why don't they? Because those black box warnings for 18 to 24 year olds, that's the age range of nearly half of all deployed American soldiers. And yet, the use of psychiatric drugs in the US military has soared 76% since 2001. That includes antidepressants that psychiatrists hand out to soldiers to prevent suicide. There's no evidence, there's no evidence that drugging stops suicide. The reason I'm, I'm saying this is because it is alleged that if somebody is suicidal, you should medicate them. Except there's no evidence that medicating somebody who is suicidal is going to prevent suicide. There's substantial evidence that many drugs actually promote suicide. And last year, within the DOD, uh, there were 349 suicides among uh, military personnel. That's almost one a day, literally one a day. That's more suicides than were killed in combat. And the military is very concerned. In fact, in uh, 2009, Fort Campbell, Kentucky was actually closed down by the base commander for a time because of they were having just an inordinate number of suicides. Suicides on Fort Campbell have to stop now. The last I heard, the VA was getting close to 450 calls a day to their suicide hotline, which they set up years ago to handle the amount of veterans 
that have suicidal thoughts on a daily basis. 450 calls a day. It's a problem that has echoed through the halls of government. One of the biggest concerns I have about the military is the inordinate number of suicides that have taken place among active duty and those who've left the military. Three years ago, I got Congress to hold hearings to examine the relationship between suicide and increased use of medications. And there was a direct parallel. The amount of suicides were increasing proportionate to the amount of medications being introduced. So do antidepressants cause suicide? Of course they do. So don't blame the soldiers. Don't blame the military as a whole. Blame the corruption of the military by the psychiatric industry that is peddling false, dangerous medicine, that is peddling a kind of modern day quackery, calling it treatment, but delivering suicide. And as bad as it is in active duty, veterans have it far worse. They're killing themselves at a rate of 22 a day, one every 65 minutes. But do psychiatrists ever consider stopping the drugging? No. Instead, it's an all-out assault. I was a very highly functioning non-commissioned officer. I was a platoon sergeant at the time. Um, I was kind of always being groomed for that next rank. Uh, I was getting sent to the right schools, had the support of my chain of command. Things were going really good. Uh, after I witnessed this traumatic event in, uh, on my last deployment in Iraq, um, that's when the medications really started coming. I mean, full force. And um, like I said before, I, you know, before I knew it, I was on nine to 12 different kind of medications. And uh, when I was going through the separation process in the Army, I had to get some physicals and evaluations from outside people. Uh, these professionals would see my records come up on the screen and the amount of medications that I was put on throughout my time in the Army, but especially the last couple of years, and they would literally gasp. And they, would, they, they were shocked at the, at the amount of drugs, the high doses of these drugs. It, it, it was like a six-page rap sheet. With all the ways psychiatric drugs can react on your body, how do psychiatrists counteract a side effect from a drug they've given you? I can't sleep at night. The stomach pains are worse than They don't take you off the drug. They'll either raise the dosage, which can cause more side effects, or they'll add another drug, which will add even more, then another, and another. It was clear right away that they really had no idea what anything that they were giving me was really going to do. They said, this drug may not work. You may need a different one. This one may need a higher dose. This one may need the lower dose. There was friends of mine that I saw had two, three, four pills that they had to take daily. You find soldiers that are on dozens of, of, of medications. And when I say, you know, seven to nine drugs at one point, I'd say that was very uh, average. I've, I've heard as high as 14. I know of some troops personally who were given up to 20 different drugs. It's kind of depressing if you look at uh, the number of medications that I've been on. It's very thick. It makes up a large portion of my medical file with the Veterans Administration. And a lot of people were on not only psychiatric drugs, but drugs for their injuries. And the combination made them different. They weren't the same people. They're mixing amphetamines with painkillers and antidepressants and sleeping pills. I mean, even the, to the unlearned, that sounds in, insane. This practice is so common, they've even got a name for it, polypharmacy. And here's a little known fact. Many of these drugs have never been tested in combination, which makes those taking the drugs little more than guinea pigs. The danger escalates with every 
increase in dose and every increase in the number of medications. I have watched my clients who have been prescribed psychotropic drugs, sometimes a cocktail, often a cocktail, sometimes a single drug, and they are grievously changed. If they were experiencing an adverse effect, how would they know which drug it was? Was it the antipsychotic? Who knows? Was it the antidepressant? Was it a combination? These guys don't know. All they know is they're supposed to take these because their doctor said they'll be better. And in fact, they only got worse. And the problem is that there's no attention to the detail of what happens to these troops that are placed on them. There's no follow-up. They're simply placed on them, given them, given a great big, huge supply of them, and they're sent out to fight. In fact, some American soldiers are routinely given up to 180 days worth of psychiatric drugs when they go to the front. No supervision, no restrictions, just take them when they want. And what happens to it when they go into combat? Are they sharing with their friends? Sure they are. Uh, that's why I've been told by social workers, uh, corpsmen, uh, medics, that 90% of the troops in combat have at one time or other taken some type of psychiatric medication. It's just a grand, crazy, insane pharmaceutical roulette that's being conducted at the expense of our nation's sons and daughters, really. My husband never did drugs, nothing, never did anything. And I dated him five years before I married him. And he never did anything like that. And then when he was in Afghanistan, the psychiatrist over there started giving him the medications for uh, depression and of course the pain that he was in because he had been hit. And the first time he got hit, they just started drugging him up. And the second time he was hit is when they sent him home to me. And two weeks after him being home, the violence was so incredible. I told him that we needed counseling or we just needed to get a divorce because I couldn't live in the abuse that I had just gone through because my husband never treated me that way. Needless to say, at that point, I didn't realize that these drugs were affecting him. At one point in time, my husband was on 21 drugs, 21 at one time. I mean, and it, it, it was craziness. This is not, I don't even know who this person is that I lived with. I've tried to get him help right from the beginning with the drugs, and they're refusing him any help. They just keep continuing to give him the drugs, and he's not getting any treatment. Um, his physical needs are not being met, and he's continuing to deteriorate on a daily basis. Um, his, uh, the whites of his eyes are now yellow. They have a yellow tint to them. His skin color is green and gray, um, and this happens often. And we do have the fear that we will wake up in the morning and he's going to die. Every day we live that every day. His daughter lives that every day. I live that every day. Is today the day that he's going to die? Is today the day I'm going to get the call? They need to give me my husband's life back is what they need to do. They need to take him off the drugs so that he can think. <clears throat> he, he can't think. He doesn't, he doesn't know. The horrible reality is that once on these drugs, it's hell to get off them. You can get addicted to some in as little as two weeks. Now we have soldiers coming back from the battlefield and they're addicted to psychotropic medications and they have a detox reaction back in civilian life and they begin to exhibit the side effects for which they were being premedicated. So they become depressed, they become suicidal. Not only is it dangerous to be on these drugs, it's also very dangerous to come off of them. Uh, in fact, in many cases, the suicides happen immediately after someone stops taking an antidepressant drug. So if you do that, make sure you do it in a way where you have medical supervision and you have a support system in place so you can get off of those drugs safely. Trying to get off psych meds by yourself, especially cold turkey, is very dangerous because of the terrible effects you may experience. I have an anxiety, I'm perspiring, I just don't know what to do. Psychiatrists will tell you it's the return of your mental illness and that you need to get back on your drugs. That isn't true. 
This is withdrawal, just like with any street drug. The doctor did not tell me if I did come straight off of these that there would be a worse effect. I didn't know that. So when I did come off it, I fell harder. These are actually addictive drugs, you know, and I didn't know how to act without them. The withdrawal process is, is, is rough. And one of the things that I experienced is all these emotions, all these feelings, all these trauma, all these, all this sadness that wasn't being dealt with, wasn't being cared for. It was, it was just being medicated. When I got off all those drugs, it was like a floodgate. Even though you come off those pills, there's a period of time for, I think, a long, long time that that stuff is coming out of your system, um, you know. And sometimes you think that life would be better if you were dead. It's shocking how many soldiers are returning home addicted to psychiatric drugs. A U.S. Army investigation discovered that as many as 35% of warrior transition units have a prescription drug problem. And very often, the addiction is not temporary, but for a lifetime. But it can get even worse than that. Because sometimes, these drugs can turn deadly, striking quickly, and without any warning. Gunnery Sergeant Chris Bacchus survived the assault on Baghdad, a deployment to Afghanistan, and a second tour in Iraq. What specifically killed your brother? He died because he mixed narcotic drugs. Whenever he had an issue with them, they would increase either the dosage or the, the potency of the individual pill. A bomb couldn't kill this Marine, but a bottle did. Chris Bacchus had two antidepressants, two opiates, and the anti-anxiety drug Ativan in his system. A total of 27 different prescriptions were found at the scene, most of them recently prescribed. The autopsy said it was the drug interaction that killed him, something any doctor worth his salt could have predicted. The case of Chris Bacchus would turn out to be no different from hundreds of others. Only 450 miles away, Stan and Shirley White celebrated the safe return of their son, 23-year-old Marine Corporal Andrew White, from the combat zone. Little did they know what would happen when he went for help to a local veterans hospital, only to be diagnosed and then drugged. Andrew's behavior really started to deteriorate. Um, we saw more and more withdrawal. We saw anger issues. Uh, at one point, he slept for two or three days at a time. The psychiatrist, their solution to his deteriorating condition was to increase his medications or to change the medications. On February 12th, 2008, Corporal White died in his sleep. Didn't even move, just died. The Coroner's report said it was at a intoxication of these drugs. Uh, not mentioned, but his heart stopped beating. Andrew being 23, being very healthy, um, not having any major issues, you shouldn't die in bed. He was one of four veterans, only in their 20s, who were found dead in bed in West Virginia within just months of each other. It took a dogged investigation by a neurologist from San Diego to find out why. I tried to understand how they could have died, what the mode, uh, the mechanism of death could have been. And these uh, dead in an undisturbed bed were cardiac. Suddenly the heart stops for some reason. Tracking down every lead, he discovered that each had been diagnosed with PTSD and all of them were taking the same potent cocktail of psychiatric drugs. Came across literature on the antipsychotics, and they said that the antipsychotics have a particular 
danger. They can stop the heart suddenly. And here these veterans, all three, were on a combination of drugs which can cause or lead to sudden cardiac death. Might this not be the tip of an iceberg? Might there be others? And uh, to make a long story short, that list grew to 250, 300, and today it is 351 probable cardiac deaths. The risk of sudden heart cardiac death makes those drugs truly unfit for human consumption. And yet they're being used like jelly beans in the military. Yeah, we're watching me here, Devil Dog. Another of those cardiac deaths was 21-year-old Corporal Chad Oligschlager. Are you kidding that? It's machine gun fire. We don't know where it's coming from. But no worries. We have our sandbag structures. Carry on. Chad was hilarious. You know, super smart. Super, super smart. He was a lot of fun. You know, he played sports. You know, all of that, like any normal kid was outdoors all the time. He was willing to make friends and talk to everybody. So that's kind of, you know, what caught my eye in the beginning as well, so. He was just fun to be around. This Native American has no comment. <laughs> well, he told me um, the reason why he wanted to join the military was that if he went, then maybe his children wouldn't have to go. He really felt like it was his, his duty as a citizen to participate. When he came back, we realized he was different. He had asked uh, his commander that you know, he wanted to seek counseling. He needed some help because he was having problems dealing with what he had done over there and what he saw on that first tour. All right, the reason I'm down here and not up there is because as soon as the IED went off, we were talking about a uh, possible trigger man. We don't know where they are because we never know where they are. Just all kind of saw like, okay, they're gonna give you some medication. You're gonna, you know, see a psychiatrist for a little bit talk it out, things will get better. Um, we were so naive. When he was on the drugs, he seemed like he was just doped up all the time. He was disoriented. It literally turned him into a walking zombie. I mean, after he would take that, and you know, and he was real adamant about making sure he took his medication on time. It just felt like the medication made him forget what he was doing. Um, made him forget things, some things that had happened in the past. We'd be talking about stories and he wouldn't believe what I was telling him. And he'd take Seroquel and then 10 minutes later be going back to his, his pill bottle and say, well, I gotta take my medication. I was like, you, you just took it. He wasn't in control, I felt like, in the end. He just really didn't know what he was doing. He wasn't going to work when he was supposed to. Um, he said he would just sleep in his room. We're gonna pause for a second due to uh, malfunctions and technical difficulties. I got the knock on the door at 11 o'clock at night. Um, but I, when I heard the knock on the door, I knew what it was. They had found Chad. And my thought was, okay, great. Where, you know, where is he? Where is his little shit? You know, I hadn't heard from him. And he said that he, he was, he was at the barracks. I said, okay, is something wrong? Can I go see him? And he said that they found him in his room, that he was dead on the floor. They didn't know how long he'd been there, that he was already gone, and I couldn't see him. I couldn't even get on base. All I could think of was that he was alone in that room by himself. <laughs> that he was supposed to be safe. It was harder for us because we always expected if he's in the military, he's in the Marines. We kind of expected that if he were to die, he was going to die when he was out on deployment. You know, he was gonna die, you know, killed in action, something. We didn't expect him to come home and die. I had a doctor at Texas A&M University read the autopsy and then said that his levels, the levels of the meds in there were not excessive. 
they were in line with what was prescribed. Nothing was out of range of, of dosage, but they looked at it and they said, how come he's taking, you know, seven of them? It's a lot. And the doctor looked right at me and said they killed him. I blame the psychiatrists and I blame the doctors for prescribing those pills. Those are the ones that never checked up on him and let him walk out with all the other pills, didn't take any of the pills away, just kept giving him more pills. And they're the ones. Good morning and oorah. Psychiatrists call these deaths accidental overdoses. But let's face it, this borders on negligent homicide. And as our soldiers succumb one by one, to prescribed levels of these lethal cocktails, you have to wonder if psychiatrists even care to find out why. It's bad enough that troops are dying, but this drug taking ripples far beyond the victim. It can also affect the lives of those they love most. I was with the 101st Airborne Division. I was assigned to them doing uh, gun truck and uh, convoy security, Operation Iraqi Freedom. I uh, came out as a captain. I've got a total of 26 months in combat. When I came out, uh, returned home from Operation Iraqi Freedom, I anyone that marked that they had seen combat or had seen someone killed or had participated in combat operations directly, um, it was mandatory that you went to mental health. Uh, I myself was prescribed uh, Prozac, Depakote, and, uh, and at one time Zoloft. Uh, one night, uh, and I'll never forget this as long as I live, one night I had laid down and I'd taken my pills and I took a shot of Jack Daniels. At that time I had my children staying with me, so I didn't get drunk or anything like that, didn't drink overly heavy, and for some reason I decided to sleep on the couch this time. And I can remember opening my eyes and not being able to move my arms and my legs and literally feeling like I was choking to death. And my son, who was 13 at the time, he came in, obviously I was making some noises and he shook me so hard that I fell off of the couch and that kind of woke me up. But literally, I felt like I was dying. And I can't help to think if my son wasn't there to wake me up, would I have been a statistic? Maybe. Active duty or veteran, a soldier on drugs can negatively affect the rest of his family. What we're seeing is that now this, this label of being broken and disordered is not only being utilized with our troops, but it's now also extended with their families. You hear stories about these young children that uh, are living with a deployed mommy or a daddy who just can't handle the deployments. So what happens is these troops that were deployed come home, whether or not they saw combat doesn't matter. They're still being forced to take a subjective questionnaire, psychiatric questionnaire, and based off of the results, are getting told to do these drugs. And when they take the drugs, they become somebody that's different than what that child remember them to be. Now that child has to deal with coping in a way that is very different than what they had to deal with when the parent was initially home. That child can't handle it. So what happens? Mom and dad says, the child needs to go see somebody for help. The child goes, see, seeks help child goes, gets the same drugs that mommy and daddy's on. Instead of dealing with the problem the right way, it's a lot easier to give a kid a pill, which ultimately destroys that young mind and ultimately erases somebody from society when that child commits suicide. My youngest son, Daniel, was a very funny, a little prankster with lots of friends in the neighborhood. Um, he was loved by his teachers at school. We would go out uh, fishing or hunting or just playing around out in the woods. So uh, we did, we're able to spend 
uh, quite a bit of time together whenever I wasn't gone on training or deployment for the Army. Daniel began having trouble sleeping um, very shortly after he left, and he was worried that his dad wouldn't come home. He was worried that his dad was gonna get killed. And we saw the psychiatrist for 10 or 15 minutes, and he prescribed um, something to help him sleep and also Celexa. Well, when she started telling me about the medications, uh, I was very concerned. Overall, it seemed to me that, you know, the situation was continuing to progress and he was just getting worse. My husband came home from Iraq three months early because of my concerns. I was very concerned at the personality change to becoming much more uh, withdrawn and uh, sad and depressed. He was having some bizarre behavior. Um, he began cutting himself at school and he began having hallucinations. Well, he never had any of those uh, behaviors before being put on the drugs. We were all here at the house. He was out of our sight for 10 or 15 minutes and he had snuck in and went and he, he'd gone into his room and I sent James to go find Daniel to help me in the yard. And he did. I don't know, what was your emergency? Um, we need an ambulance. What's going on? Um, my little brother hung himself. <laughs> okay, what's his name? Daniel Raines. My mom is performing CPR right now. Okay, let me transfer you, don't you? He was an innocent little boy who was just worried about his dad, who prayed every night that his dad would be safe, and that his dad would come home, and that angels would protect him. But there wasn't anybody to protect my son. Psychiatry in the military took our youngest son from us and ruined our family. Children are a huge target for psychiatrists. 1.9 million of them have a parent in the military and a million have had a parent deploy. And when you're a little kid worried about mommy or daddy, that makes you fair game. The numbers of, of children who have been put on drugs within the military TRICARE system is astounding. You know, it's just exploding. So it has an effect, a ripple effect, on the entire family unit. Now, today, we're finding out outpatient psychiatric treatment for children of deployed active duty service members has reached an all-time high at two million visits. How many drugs are these children being forced to take now? Whatever it is, it's high. According to a study in the Journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, 91% of all kids visiting a child psychiatrist come away with a psychiatric drug. Is this really what we want for our children? You have to wonder why, with all this failure, psychiatrists keep hurting people, drugging them, addicting them, creating violence and suicide. It is for the most disgraceful of reasons. Psychiatrists say that disorders like PTSD can't be cured. Instead, they claim they need to be managed with drugs for the rest of your life. It's bad medicine, but great for the bank account. Once you label somebody and you start medicating them, over the life of that person, it's gonna cost the government about a million and a half to provide these medications and treatment. There's a lot of money to be made here. There's a lot of money to be made by the, the companies that are producing these drugs. Profit is the only conceivable motive for all of these psychiatric drugs in the military. Taxpayers are footing the bill for this travesty of medicine. These psychiatric drugs that promote suicides, you're paying for them. 
So why do psychiatrists hand out drugs at such record levels? Because drugging people is a lot easier than actually helping them. And because of this explosion of psychiatric drugging, psychiatry has developed a very close relationship with drug companies. And they'll tell you all about it. Unfortunately, almost everywhere you look, you'll find financial conflicts of interest. Take Matthew Friedman, a psychiatrist and executive director of the VA's National Center for PTSD. Not only has Friedman been a paid speaker for three different drug makers, he also sat on the scientific advisory boards of the pharmaceutical companies that make Paxil and Zoloft. And guess what? These happen to be the only two psychiatric drugs approved by the U.S. government to treat PTSD. And then there's Dr. Elspeth Cameron Ritchie, until recently, the top psychiatrist in the U.S. Army. She praised the antipsychotic Seroquel for being very useful for the treatment of anxiety and combat-related nightmares. Not only is Seroquel totally unapproved for that purpose, it's linked to sudden cardiac death. Soldiers call it Sarah Kill. On the street, it's baby heroin. That same year, Richie starred in a webcast, partially bankrolled by Seroquel's maker, in which she continued to push the use of psychiatric drugs on the battlefield. Of course, I'm a psychiatrist, so I tend to think of psychiatric medications, and we treat soldiers with medications, with cognitive behavioral therapy, and other sophisticated treatments on the battlefield. Finally, their psychiatrist and former Brigadier General Stephen Zanakis. When he was in the Army, he pushed hard for frequent psychiatric screening of soldiers. The more, the better. Today, the Army screens its soldiers as many as five separate times, including a mandatory psychiatric screening when returning home from deployment and a follow-up six months later. And these screenings are loaded with conflicts of interest. The development of one questionnaire, recommended by the Army Surgeon General, was funded by Pfizer, the maker of the antidepressant Zoloft. Another screening program for service members and their families is administered by a group given millions of dollars from eight different drug companies. But Zanakis wants his own piece of the pie. He stands to make millions as CEO of a corporation selling a brain scanning device he plans to use to diagnose PTSD. Bottom line, with psychiatry, it's all about money, certainly not about help. And yet, without reforming this broken and ineffective system, the United States Department of Veterans Affairs recently hired 1,600 more mental health workers just to handle the problems the profession itself worsened. If all we're doing when we get more mental health professionals is more of the same thing, but then it's a fool's errand. And for the soldier who joined out of duty and served with honor, it all boils down to one word, betrayal. One of the things I have the benefit of really is getting thousands of emails a week whether it's from veterans or other people suffering from pharmaceutical damage, it's specifically veterans these days, we see an increase. We see people calling out and saying they feel betrayed. They are very proud to serve, fight for their countries, protect you know, the people back home, their loved ones. And I think all they ask for is to come home and be treated fairly, given answers and looked after. And they're not looked after, they're told, it's all in your head, it's mental, take the tablets, it'll cure, go away, and that's it. And I think that is betrayal for a word to use for those people is an understatement. It's the deepest betrayal of a human being to, to, to kill them while claiming you're treating them, to call it medicine and deliver death. And it's all so needless, because there is hope and it doesn't involve psychiatric treatment. Look around, and unfortunately, you'll find a world saturated with psychiatry. 
But there are safe, effective, and workable solutions, and they can be found. The main word for soldiers, and not only soldiers, but anybody suffering from any type of mental, so-called mental illness, is that there's hope. That there's hope out there, there's solutions out there, things are available for you to get your life back, to not have suicidal thoughts, to not end your life, and it does not include psychiatric drugs. There is a way to solve this. It's to get rid of the drugs and start treating soldiers like human beings, not lab rats. That's the solution. The vets who, who get over their war wounds do it on their own, do it with friends, do it with colleagues, do it in support groups. Um, they're doing it separate and distinct from the uh, medical interventions. If you talk to lads, when they get together, they help one another, they support one another. They, they are aware of fellow feeling, fellow understanding. Psychiatrists, by having the opportunity to disrupt that process by using drugs, can often disrupt it rather than support it. A soldier does need help. He needs care and love and friendship and, you know, whatever else is going to make him feel better personally, but he does not need psychotropic drugs. True medical care can begin with a full, searching, physical examination by a competent medical doctor to check for any underlying injury or illness that may be causing emotional distress. Every symptom should be investigated for physical origins because if you don't do that, almost certainly someone who has a real physical symptom is being labeled as having a psychiatric symptom, which is false. By making sure that we clear up any physical issues, we begin to make the soldier, the veteran, feel better. Once they begin to feel better, they feel better physically, they feel better emotionally, and they're able to deal with some of the issues relative to the traumas or the stress that they were under while in combat. If you're on psychiatric drugs and want to get off, make sure it's under the supervision of a competent medical practitioner. Getting off the drugs is one of the best things that I've done and because it's helped me out. It helped me be back being Mike Mezen, you know, and, and it really saved my life. It's transformed my life. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's also made me real, look real hard at the damage that those drugs were doing me while I was on. It was that type of incident that catalyzed my resolve to aborting the system that I was in and moving forward with a non-pharmaceutical approach, which has been phenomenally successful for me. I'm not the same person. But there are still many soldiers right now very much at risk for being ordered onto psychiatric drugs. That's why it's vitally important to know your rights. There is an obligation for the service to take care of our sons and daughters that are sacrificing themselves and giving an oath to defend the Constitution with their life. I mean, that's a big deal. The command may say, you have to go to see a psychiatrist because we believe you to be unstable. So does he have to show up for the appointment? The answer is yes. However, once you go into that therapist office, you are not required to participate in that treatment. So on occasion, I have people that call me and ask me, you know, can I refuse this or can I refuse that? And I say, absolutely. Underlying this right to refuse is one of the most important rights of all, informed consent. Informed consent means you have the right to be informed in advance of all risks and benefits of the proposed psychiatric treatment, any alternative treatments, and the option of no treatment at all. Do active duty and military have a right to informed consent? Absolutely. But these soldiers, sailors, marines are not informed as to all of the consequences of these medications. Because if you were truly informed as to the consequences of taking these drugs, would you really take them? You know, and, and the answer is most likely no. Informed consent is just one of many rights you have under the Military Code of the United States. Numerous other countries also offer informed consent rights, but it is up to you to demand it. Get involved and tell others about these rights.
Many courageous survivors of military psychiatry and their families are speaking out right now, and they could use your help. I don't want another family to experience what we've experienced. Unfortunately, that's happening. This is an outrage. What's going on here? Are, are, are these young people just guinea pigs? Apparently so. My daughter was a guinea pig, and she's gone. One of Tony's last things, you know, he always told me, just keep speaking up, Mom. Even if you only help one person, just keep speaking up. My goal is not just to tell Anthony's story, but I feel it's a story that's not unique. It's something that's happening to so many of our troops. As an advocate for my son and an advocate for wounded veterans across the country, our group that I work with, uh, we're trying to make a change in that direction. So we've made it our mission that we're going to tell everybody we can and have the website, have as much information that we can. We've got to get the word out to our soldiers, don't take these drugs. Don't take these drugs. It's the beginning of the end. Immediate action is needed, not just in the United States, but around the world. More British soldiers and veterans committed suicide in 2012 than were killed in battle. Same thing for the relatively small Australian military over the past decade. 20% of the deaths of German troops abroad are from suicide. And the Russian military has a suicide rate 65% higher than the rest of the entire country. So what is the solution? Get rid of psychiatry and mental health. Don't leave them in charge. Mental health will not improve until psychiatrists are no longer in charge of it. I truly believe that they are destroying our military. The battlefield is safer than psychiatry. Do you understand that? Statistically, you are less likely to be shot by an enemy than to be killed by a pharmaceutical drug. That's the truth about psychiatry. And yet, psychiatry's reach today goes well beyond the military. It is just as J.R. Reese planned Psychiatric treatment tested out and advanced within the military, spilling out into every nook and cranny of civilian life. Psychiatry is currently an international $330 billion a year industry. It promised help. It delivers pain, damage, and death. The hidden enemy has now been revealed. What happens next is up to all of us. You've got the facts. Fight back.